Okay, so welcome uh, everyone. Uh, this is uh, Nicola Marzari from uh, EPFL, and uh, I have uh, the great uh, pleasure of uh, introducing, introducing our uh, 34th distinguished lecture that uh, uh, will be given by Professor Claudia Felser, uh, that is the director of the Max Planck Institute for Chemical Physics of Solids uh, in Dresden, Germany. Uh, before introducing uh, Professor uh, uh, Felser, let me also mention uh, that the next uh, distinguished lecture will be given on June 20th, always at 3 p.m. by Professor Emmanuel Kubakis of the University of Michigan. Now, uh, Professor Felser mm, probably doesn't need any introduction, but it's always a, a pleasure to uh, do one. And uh, in particular, she studied at the University of Cologne, both uh, for her diploma and for her PhD in physical chemistry that she obtained in 1994. And after a brief postdoctoral uh, studies, uh, she started as an assistant professor at the University of Mainz in 1996. Uh, where uh, she you know, followed a full uh, tenure ladder and became a full professor in 2003. Uh, from 2011, she's the director of the Max Planck Institute uh, for Chemical Physics of Solids in Dresden. Uh, as you all know, some of her core research interests are in the design, uh, synthesis, and characterization of quantum materials, uh, particular accomplishment on Heusler compounds and topological materials, both for energy application and uh, spin tonics. Uh, a very long uh, list uh, of uh, awards, uh, but maybe I think uh, uh, what is uh, very prominent is also the membership in both uh, uh, national academies from the Leopoldina, the German National Academy of Science, the German National Academy of Science and Engineering, uh, but also in the United States at uh, the National Academy of Engineering uh, and the National Academy of uh, Sciences. Uh, she also received in 2018 uh, the uh, James McGrady Prize uh, for New Materials uh, from the American Physical uh, Society together with Bernevik and uh, Dye, and in 2022 the Max Born Prize uh, and Medal of the German Physical Society and the Institute of Physics uh, together with the Wilhelm Oswald Medal of the Samsung Academy of Science. So with this, uh, I think it's really a great uh, pleasure uh, to have here Professor Felser, and uh, I think uh, I leave uh, the floors uh, for the presentation. Uh, people are uh, very much uh, welcome uh, to write uh, their question in the question of answers, uh, so I'll read them at the end, or also uh, welcome to raise their hand if they wanted to do a live question. Uh, with this, uh, I think uh, we are uh, ready to go. And uh, again, a very warm welcome. Thanks a lot. Okay. Yeah, for, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, I had some te technical issues, sorry. I'm very happy to give this uh, distinguished lecture here. And uh, I'm looking forward to get many, many interesting questions. Today, I want to talk about uh, a subject which I like very much uh, in recent days, uh, the connection be between chirality and topology, uh, one of the main subjects we worked in the past. So the so far, we if we think in general about the subject of topology, I would say we only see the tip of the iceberg and there's a lot to do. And especially with the connection between topology and chirality, I see that there's still a lot of interesting hidden uh, areas uh, for physics and materials science. So uh, the field of topology, uh, maybe all are familiar with, but I want to give this as a short introduction, especially if there are students around. So um, the, in mathematics, the field of topology was developed in mathematics, and in mathematics, it deals with the um, topology of objects, which is a so-called genus. And uh, the number related to the object is related to the number of holes in an object. So, for example, this pancake has no hole, very similar like this cube, while a donut has one hole, similar to a coffee cup. 
some of you maybe already have seen the transformation of a donut into a coffee pot, and they have the gene, genus of one. But we can continue with three, like the German Brezel here, etc. So this concept is transferred to, uh, to condensed matter physics, and it's extremely successful, I would say, since 2005, 2006. But the uh, story of uh, topology in condensed metaphysics has already started earlier with the discovery of the quantum Hall effect by Klaus von Klitzing. So um, he discovered that if he uh, has a complex sample, a two-dimensional electron gas made by gallium arsenic, uh, some semiconductors in a certain way that the concentration of the defects is well balanced to the electrons and between two layers, of different composition, they have exactly this two-dimensional electron gas. And uh, what happens if you do high field investigation and work at very low temperatures, so suddenly it happens that the resistance versus the magnetic field is not simple, a simple linear behavior. It shows this very nice plateaus. The origin of these plateaus is that the electrons in general are localized by the magnetic field and uh, the only conducting electrons are at the edges of the samples and they are spin polarized. So one assumes that there are two currents which uh, where spin and momentum is locked. So if you would simply make a wedge here in the, uh, 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 here in the samples, then uh, you don't destroy this uh, current. You simply, uh, the current would go around the uh, uh, distorted area. So this is only observed in complex layered system and everybody thought this is a very, uh, uh, very uh, uh, exotic effect. But uh, it's also interesting that, our, uh, so nowadays we also by ourselves found that it, you can even find this quantization in three dimensional crystals here. I want to show only one example, it's hafnium telluride. So you put them simply on a, on a, a, a puck of a standard PPMS uh, measurement equipment. And then you measure simply, also here's the transport and you see that you see also very nice plateaus even at fractional values. So here the origin for this is probably that we have a quasi two dimensional material and we might can even learn here uh, in the context of hafnium telluride, even what happens. So we could imagine this as a stacking of two-dimensional electron gas and the interaction between the layers uh, describes and very well uh, the interaction between uh, 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 the role of the uh, uh, interaction in this two-dimensional material. So this is a very interesting result because for me it always shows also that we could have thought about uh, quantum Hall effect much earlier, uh, even by doing a more careful measurement at low temperature in three-dimensional materials. But the interesting and uh, also next step in the field of quantum Hall effect and topology was that people thought what Klaus von Klitzing did at quite high magnetic field could be also possible in magnetic materials, because in the magnetic materials, we know that the intrinsic magnetic field is higher than even what the uh, magnetic fields were uh, used by Klaus von Klitzing. So he, Haldane, wrote a theory paper where he said, so you could find the quantum Hall effect even without Landau levels if you would realize it in the magnetic materials. I am surprised, but also this paper was probably not read by the people in the Spentronic community because otherwise people would have had this materials already in uh, uh, in their uh, uh, maybe shelves uh, to do some investigation in this direction. Okay, what is possible uh, with magnetic materials due to the spin, uh, people thought, and this people maybe from the PSI would also think immediately about this. You could maybe see also if you take spin orbit coupling into account. And this has led to the paper which started the revolution of topology, finally the paper of Kane and Mela who thought simply maybe spin orbit coupling can do the same work as uh, magnetism. So uh, they used as a model system very similar like uh, Haldane and hexagonal lattice here of carbon because carbon has this very nice uh, linear dispersion here, the Dirac cones in the electronic structure and they predicted the quantum spin hall effect. Uh, however, 
they use carbon. And we know from the periodic table, carbon is somewhere up in, at the top of the periodic table. So spin-orbit coupling is very weak. Uh, so people expected that this doesn't work with carbon, but uh, there was a solution in mind of many people easily because we simply should take materials with large uh, spin-orbit coupling. You should look uh, for materials at the uh, bottom of the periodic table. So the recipe to find topological material is quite easy. So therefore, also many material scientists and chemists have joined the uh, work on topological materials. So you simply need the so-called band inversion. So in a normal semiconductor, we have the valence band and the conduction band and the band gap. And the band gap, the size of the band gap depends on the bonding strengths of the material. And we can have also negative band gaps, as we know from uh, materials which we normally uh, be interested in semiconductors, be, uh, for uh, for example, for uh, 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 optical ap uh, application. So, but what can happen here if there is this overlap of the bands and we have a strong spin-orbit coupling? So, spin-orbit coupling can make this crossing point to a forbidden crossing, and we end up with an electronic structure like this. So, we again have a semiconductor because we have a band gap now, but now we have a part of the conduction band in the valence band, and vice versa. And uh, so, these two different electronic structures of semiconductors can be described by different topologies. So, they are not. Uh, so you cannot transform a normal semiconductor into a topological semiconductor without uh, using a scissor uh, to transform this in the same uh, topological electronic structure. So, uh, and because of the band inversion here in this material, so we will have a surface state, a spin polarized surface state, very similar, like uh, we have seen it uh, in case of the two-dimensional electron gas of the quantum Hall effect. So this is a three-dimensional version in some sense of the quantum Hall effect and different from our insulating crystals here, which is a trivial semiconductor. We have now a semiconductor, which is maybe on insulator, which is insulating in the bike. And we have the electron uh, uh, on the surface, which uh, distinct or is, a, uh, is a consequence of the different topology of the crystal and the surrounding, like the vacuum, for example, or the air, because this is all trivial. And then the crystal develops a singularity on the surface. And this is uh, protected by the intrinsic properties of the material. So if we destroy the surface here, the topological surface states simply go further into the crystal, but they will not be destroyed. The interesting thing is if we have the spin and the momentum lock, we have chiral electrons here at the surface, similar like uh, on the quantum Hall effect. So nowadays we investigated so far all the 250,000 known compounds in the database of inorganic compounds. And the first conclusion after all this uh, general investigation is that more than 25% of the materials are topological. If we even allow the Fermi level, the energy between uh, occupied and unoccupied states to be uh, to change by doping, for example, uh, then or by strain or something, then probably even more uh, of the materials are topological. So in this paper, so at the end we end up with like seventy to eighty percent. Uh, so this, uh, I already mentioned, this electrons where the spin and the momentum is locked, uh, they behave like uh, cars on an uh, autobahn, so they cannot uh, turn around uh, because spin and momentum is locked, so the, uh, the scattering into the other direction is forbidden, which makes these compounds very, very interesting also eventually for interconnects, etc., so the electron chirality is comparable in a sense like the chirality we know from chemistry. And in my talk, I try also to reach out in very different uh, uh, directions. So if we have a carbon atom, which uh, uh, carbon can have four ligands, and if you make a molecule which has four different ligands, then the molecule is chiral. So one, if I make a... Uh, the molecules by chemical synthesis, I will always have 50% of molecules with one handedness and 50% with the other handedness. So this is uh, always uh, because of energy reasons. And one big question in chemistry is how can we make only one chirality of molecules? 
Uh, and this is really a very big question in organic chemistry. So, but is there a connection between, or can both fields eventually learn from each other? This is one of the big questions I have, and uh, this could even uh, maybe interest more chemists in the future uh, to join the field of topology. So I already mentioned the topological insulators, but uh, all the 250,000 compounds are very often metals. Uh, also semi-metal, semiconductor. So uh, again, here we look for this bent inversion and uh, we have very often an overlapping region. So depending where we have our Fermi energy, so if we have crossing areas, so in, a, in case of a metal or uh, just here at the so-called nodal line, we have always topological materials. But despite of a topological insulator, we can have also another special situation, a Dirac semi-metal I already mentioned in the context of the graphene. So we can end up that not the whole area, overlapping area in the material is forbidden so that we, uh, depending from the symmetry of our crystals, if we have rotation symmetry, we might uh, end up here with this degenerated points and this linear dispersion, and we can have Dirac semi-metals or white semi-metals. So in case the distinction between Dirac and white semi-metals, the difference is simply the symmetry. So Dirac semi-metal can uh, turn into white semi-metal if we reduce the symmetry. So Dirac semi-metal, so central symmetric white semi-metals have no inversion symmetry or by applying a magnetic field because time reversal symmetry is another way to generate white semi-metals. So white semi-metals are extremely interesting. So Dirac, the Dirac, uh, 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 so there are two special solutions of the Dirac equation. One leads to the Dirac semi-metals. One is the Weyl equation. The Weyl equation, because of lower symmetry, has very distinguished properties. So we can have these two linear points, while in Dirac semiconductors they uh, are degenerated. So we have a fourfold degeneration, while we here in Weyl semi-metals metals, we have a twofold degeneration. But here, because of the very special electronic structure and the low symmetry, even the bike electrons are chiral. So they can be distinguished by their chirality. So in our crystal, in the bike, these different Y points can serve as the sink and the source of the phase of the electronic structure, which is here symbolized by different colors. And uh, what we do in calculation look by the Berry curvature. The, also, the white semi-metals and Dirac semi-metals have very special surface states. This is a connection between the two Y points in the, uh, in the uh, visible by surface uh, investigation science like Engelers or photo emission people from the PSI are super experts in this field and have already discovered many interesting compounds while and Dirac semi-metals. Okay, so another uh, property despite of the uh, Engelers or photo emission, uh, et cetera, of, for example, what is PSI very famous for us because it can do it spin polarized is uh, uh, the investigation of transport properties. And this uh, there's a chiral anomaly got a lot of attention because this is a very interesting anomaly, which is only related and appears only in quantum, in the quantum world. So, and it was originally formulated for by solving the Dirac equation for vacuum fluctuation, which probably could be uh, happen in the Big Bang uh, moment and uh, explaining why we have an asymmetry between particles and antiparticles. So this is possible because of this anomalous non-conservation of a chiral current. So uh, we can get an asymmetry here. In an analog experiment, one could think in Dirac semi-metals by applying magnetic field or vice semi-metals, we could have this asymmetry between electrons and holes. So this was, as I said, originally formulated in high energy physics and then later transfer to, uh, for example, even helium or condensed matter physics. So in this sense, it's not really, we are not looking for particles and antiparticles, we're looking for quasi-particles in our condensed matter system. Okay, so um, here is uh, more or less my list of to do. What we have to do, if we find then this wild semi-metals, and it took some time until, why semi-metal were discovered. The first proposals were in oxide. So, and then people were looking first for photo emission data 
to see the surface state, the Fermi axis, and the white points in the electronic structure. Another general feature is the giant response in all these materials due to an external stimuli. And this is also related because we have this nice linear dispersion here. So the response typically in the arc and vice metal is giant, magneto resistance are giant, which leads also to very large mean free passes in this materials. Again, some possibility for application. And the chiral anomaly, um, which I already explained. So this is related to this equation. So different from uh, Hall measurement, we have to have the current and the magnetic field in parallel, like it's symbolized here. So then one should get an asymmetry between electron and holes, even in a material which has a compensated uh, uh, behavior. And uh, the same can be reached if you apply to a thermoelectric measurement, if you apply a temperature gradient. The so-called axial gravitational anomaly, was, which was originally formulated in astrophysics. So these were two interesting experiments, which really could fundamental show, fundamental show a parity violation in uh, with help of a condensed matter system, which so far were not seen in uh, in high energy physics. So still the, the, uh, the existence or the validity of a chiral anomaly was not uh, proven yet. So the success started with the prediction of uh, white semi-metals by Andre Bonovic's group and Chidai, and at the same time also by uh, Hassan's group. It, and the good thing was, it was is this is a very simple system. It's a tetragonal structure. It's a binary system. So it's very easy to grow single crystal of this material by chemical vapor transport. So you simply need the temperature gradient in your uh, in your uh, during your reaction. So you start with a polycrystalline powder, have iodide as a transport agent, and then you get this fantastic large crystals. So first experiment always. Uh, is the angles of photo emission, which people, uh, scientists normally do. And as I mentioned, so PSI has really ultra good conditions, especially also we can do spin polarized apples there. And uh, so here you see uh, the first measurement, um, I think on this kind of materials, which nicely shows the linear dispersion and we also the splitting of the dispersive bands in the white semi-metal tantalum arsenic. So uh, we investigated together with Julian Chen and Bin Haiyan uh, uh, the whole series and niobium phosphide extensively. And uh, you see here with the increasing spin-orbit coupling by making the elements heavier and heavier in the periodic table, you can uh, increase the splitting of the bands due to spin-orbit coupling, and this has the surface state, the density functional theory calculation, and the measurement. And also here, you see the white splitting goes with the spin-orbit coupling. Uh, it increases with uh, the uh, nuclear average nuclear charge of the material. Anyway, but we wanted to look for the chiral anomaly, and this was work mainly done by Johannes Goat. So he, but also other uh, groups did uh, similar experiments at with other materials. So here is simply the example of niobium phosphide. And the niobium phosphide we have uh, done via focus ion beam, which is very well known, that you can make very nice samples with focus ion beam, thanks to uh, 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 members of the EPA <laughs> for a long time, which have developed this uh, extensively, uh, Philip Moll. So we made simple uh, nanowires here and measured the uh, chiral anomaly in niobium phosphide. And you see here the conductivity, uh, conductance. So it's first negative. And then if you move the B field in parallel to the E, uh, to the current, which is exactly the condition of the chiral anomaly, you see it changes the sign as you can see here in the measurement. Okay, so, but this was already done on other materials. So our interest was here to do the thermoelectric counterpart, there were interesting prediction by Subir Sachdev, who said this is the axial gravitational anomaly experiment. He predicted the properties and uh, Karl Landsteiner, who had also a prediction in this direction. So we did here also the experiment and we saw also this design uh, change here by changing the B field to parallel to the current. 
Anyway, so you can say it's something simple. It's a simple experiment, but this brought our paper into at least the New York Times, thanks to the IBM contribution from Zurich. So they have a very good press department <laughs> and they uh, could sell the results of the measurement uh, in the best way. Okay, so you can say, is this something very, very uh, unique? No, you can see it in many systems and a few systems were investigated in the same way, having the terminal trans uh, the, uh, transport and the terminal transport at the same time. For example, Herrmann's group did a very nice work to tune the bismuth to exactly the Y points, and then they measured the, uh, the chiral anomaly and the axial gravitational anomaly at the same time. And you can nicely see that it, uh, this is the wiedemann franz law. So you have this L0, which should be always one. And you see the uh, investigation even fulfills the wiedemann franz law. So you get this asymmetry in transport uh, in uh, but there seems to be not as a effect, which was partially a discussion in case of other samples because of the high magnetoresistance resistance effect. Anyway, so we are quite convinced that there is a chiral and an axial gravitational anomaly in these materials. And people in high energy physics trying to show this experiment by heavy ion collision. And the plan is there may be having results soon or in, in a few years. But you can see this also in magnetic cargo lattice. This was uh, the first magnetic ferromagnetic white semi-metals. Here you see nicely the crossing points in this material because it's a half metallic ferromagnet. It has quite a simple band structure, only one kind of ferromagnetic bands all around the Fermi energy and therefore a simple crossing. And the interesting thing is every ferromagnetic material which has a, cro is a crossing in every ferromagnetic material is a wide crossing. This is very interesting because so far there are not so many discovered magnetic materials, but I'm quite sure there's an inflation out there. And you see nicely here's Y points by CRM calculated. And uh, here also this material was investigated by Engel Resolve for Termission, again with Julian Chen. They looked for the surface state and you see also here a nice agreement between the bike and the surface state. And as I mentioned here, the, um, uh, so the Y points are here are slightly above the Fermi energy, therefore it was necessary to uh, do the surface, uh, surface of the material with potassium atoms, so to change the Y point below the Fermi energy that it became visible via Engelres of photo emission. So, uh, so you can imagine how many people look for Y physics and new Y semi-metals, and it's a, a growing interesting field of uh, where one can find very interesting physics, even beyond this, what I showed here. And I also still try to encourage the theoretician to write in a simple, understandable way for us to discover also where we can do more experiments which are um, connecting uh, high energy physics and uh, condensed matter physics. So this parity violation, which I described here in uh, the chiral anomaly is not the only one. One important was that there's a parity violation in the weak force. So if you, unfortunately, this uh, video doesn't work, but you can imagine simply if you look for the better decay of uh, radioactive cobalt atoms. So you will see, depending from the winding uh, of the, of your, uh, of your uh, coil. So uh, there's a broken symmetry also related to chirality. This was predicted by Yang and Lee. They got the Nobel Prize for this, but experimentally shown by Mrs. Wu, uh, who was not considered at this time. But I think she's a very good female role model. And I think <laughs> I was very proud to visit China during the last uh, two weeks. And uh, uh, saw so also a photo from Li in uh, Wu in Hangzhou, where uh, Li uh, did his undergraduate study. But another broken symmetry I already mentioned, it's interesting to make the connection to chemistry, is that we are made by only molecules of one-handedness. And nobody so far understands how this has worked, this fundamental broken symmetry, that we were made only by molecules, uh, DNA, 
of one-handedness and we eat only sugars of uh, also one-handedness. So also the medical research is mainly related to making chiral molecules. And so far, if you do a synthesis, as I mentioned, you have exactly 50-50% of each uh, kind of molecules. So it's still the open question how to put our chirality out and get, chiral, uh, get put our chirality in and get chirality out. So what was the original experiment which has broken the symmetry for life? Okay, this uh, uh, subject, the chiral anomaly and the origin of life and the origin of the universe was, by the way, a very subject of a very nice Nobel symposium, which I have to say has inspired me a lot. The American were unfortunately online at this time, but I was happy to be there. And all the talks were organized by Frank Wilczek. Uh, starting, as I mentioned, to uh, from high energy physics, astrophysics, up to biology. And this, the biologist even showed nicely somebody like Ben Feringa that you can even have uh, uh, broken symmetries. And if you start with a molecule, uh, this is a big question, but then everything is chiral uh, in your body, even on a higher organizational level. Okay, so... On the other side, also in topology, we have chiral crystals because this is a interesting. So more or less from the 230 uh, crystal structures, we have 11 really chiral crystal structures, but we have also 43 crystal structures which can host chiral, uh, uh, so can have uh, chiral crystal uh, chiral structures. So if you think this is nearly 25%, so it uh, should be quite a common observation to see chiral crystals. So far, I have to say this was an interesting remark of our Siri colleague. There are not so many chiral materials found in the topological database. And one reason can be that it's also difficult to get homochiral crystals, so crystals which are only made by one chirality. So quartz, for example, is a very prominent crystal, which is chiral, but there are many, many more. And the question is, why don't we see so many homochiral crystals or why don't we see so many, not so many chiral space groups? And one reason I think is because you can have then both chiralities and domains in a crystal, which then gives you a higher symmetry, a non-chiral space group, but this is simply because we don't look uh, carefully enough. And I think there's also a lot to do to look more for chirality in crystal C. Okay, so why is this interesting? Because if you have chiral crystal structure, you can go beyond Dirac and Y fermions. So I already described Y fermions and Dirac fermions. So you can, for example, find chiral fermions, which can have also chiral uh, linear dispersive Y points or related Y points. And it's also interesting to look for new fermions which have higher degenerated points. They can be fourfold, sixfold, eightfold, and so on. So, so far, if we only look for high energy physics analogs, so this are the Weil and Dirac equation, but this is really interesting to look even for more in condensed matter physics uh, enables us to see more. And this, <laughs> encourage the referee, who was probably Carl Bin, Carlo Binacker, to even give a citation of Heisenberg. So he already thought it would be great if he could put a lattice on the universe, because then we might can have something beyond Dirac and Y physics and what we know in our universe. So we might can have electrons that could morph into protons. We all know this is, that this doesn't happen. It's really a crazy idea, as Heisenberg recognized by himself. But the question is, still can we maybe see a uh, very special physics in chi chiral topological materials. One thing is, so if we combine chiral crystals, we already know that they have special optical activities uh, together with topological crystals. I already described the white semi metal. So the results are these new fermions and they have very interesting properties. One property is that the crossing points might be not at the same energy and we always care if you think about why fermions that they may be uh, annihilate each other and turn into a direct semi metal. Uh, so, this could be not possible if they have, uh, there are different energies and there are different places, uh, uh, different uh, uh, 
uh, spots in the reciprocal space. So as for example, they are for at the gamma point at the corner, and this leads also to giant surface states. And depending from the chirality of the crystal, you can have different chiralities of the surface state. So this, I think, is very interesting for me, who thinks also about catalysis and topology. And this is some experiments which we plan in the future. So, but uh, bringing optical activity together with chirality, there is an interesting prediction that you should see a quantized circular photogalvanic effect, a prediction where we worked on and have already some intermediate results, but it's not really proven. So we still have to look for better chiral materials. In general, I can say we only took uh, a few materials so far uh, without very systematic investigation so there is still a lot of space to find very good materials so the following work is strongly related to uh, Niels uh, Schröter's work who was also at the PSI and uh, was very much interested in motivating us also to work in this field so the interesting thing is here in this chiral crystals here so you can have then the realization more or less like two states which we already described by the E dot B term in a wild semi-metal. So we can have for the two-handedness. So you would uh, expect that they have different chiralities uh, also in the electronic structure. So the crystal structure determines also in the sense the electronic structure. So the phase, not the, the band structure will be identically for both chirality, but the phase, the very phase should be distinguished. Okay, so the first thing is to synthesize the compounds, and this is a little bit challenging. So we have a big project now to try to synthesize homochiral crystals, which in general is not so easy. You can imagine if you use the seed crystal of one chirality, you might be able to grow crystals of one chirality. But in all the other methods, you can think it could be difficult. There could be some ideas. We have some ideas how to influence the uh, uh, the chirality eventually in the optical floating zone. But this is also a big open question in organic crystals, which are synthesized eventually from water at low temperature in water. There are already some ideas. One puts a small chiral molecule in to uh, make sure that you synthesize homochiral crystal. Luckily, there are a few crystals in the chiral space group, which was already discussed in the theory paper, which are grown homochiral. So far, we don't know how we really get this very nice homochiral uh, crystal. Sometimes we, like in cobalt silicide, we have big areas of one chirality, not very fine domains, which allows us also to investigate the chiral properties. So uh, one method to really distinguish the different chiralities, this year is a B20 structure. It's also, again, a binary compound like cobalt silicide, rhodium silicide, platinum aluminum, palladium aluminum, et cetera. So uh, gallium uh, and also this crystal structure is already known because there are a few magnetic compounds and they show uh, skirmion behavior. So very interesting chiral behavior of the spins structure in this magnetic material. So there might be a connection even between this real space and the reciprocal space topology. There are first publication in this direction, but not really uh, well understood yet. And with electron backscattering diffraction, we are able to really investigate bigger parts of the crystals, which is important because X-ray only allows us to look uh, for a, a spot size uh, area on our crystal. To make sure that we have a homochiral crystal, it's important to do this electron backscattering diffraction. So the first thing, uh, what was uh, then necessary, and I told you already, this is the work of Nils Schröter, was to look whether the band structure we have by theory, which is, was already published in this 2016 paper and later 2018 also from in a paper from Hassan, is like that you get exactly what you, you expect in a single particle picture. So this uh, at the gamma point, this four fold degenerated fermion and at the R point, the six fold degenerated uh, fermion. And uh, this are uh, uh, even the, uh, the splitting, if you assume that's a, uh, the spin orbit coupling. 
Okay, so we, as I mentioned already, we were able to uh, synthesize both chirality, and I think in 70% we had the right-handed crystal, and in 30% we have the left-handed crystal. It doesn't look also so nice, but uh, uh, so the band structure, as I mentioned, is absolutely the same. So the only distinguish, uh, distinction between these two crystals is the antibody phase. So the first thing what Niels did, he investigated the uh, simple volume band structure and he could show that we really have a fourfold degenerated and sixfold degenerated point and uh, that we have the chiral surface state uh, for two different samples with different chirality. Okay, so, but he was interested to really look for this higher churn number. This was the second paper of him in collaboration with us to look really uh, for the uh, uh, churn number in this different enantiomers. So we luckily had two different enantiomers and he could really show uh, that the churn number is here, plus two and minus two. So he really looked for the churn number four in this material by looking very careful here on different cuts of the uh, surface states here, which is proven here that this is surface states. And uh, uh, you saw the splitting, so which goes with the number two. And then you can even show that they have different slope to see the plus and minus two. So, uh, but to see then really the, um, the uh, uh, distinction between the two chiralities of the crystals, so we did the first measurements of the circular polarized light, and I'm sure this is by Mango Yao, who was also at PSI together with Niels. So uh, because uh, so this allows us to visualize uh, the different enantiomers, and you see, so if we do this measurement with circular polarized light, we can distinguish these two enantiomers like one hand and the other hand. And this is in very nice agreement if we do pair curvature calculation, which is also proportional to the orbital angular momentum. And here you see also nicely that they are behaving like uh, uh, what you expect by chirality. Anyway, this uh, data is not yet published, so there's still some discussion because one has to avoid that one imprint some chirality by the circular polarized light. Okay, similar experiments were done with samples also from rhodium psilocyte and cobalt psilocyte by Hassan's group. You see here also the nice chiral surface states and the Fermi acts and their agreement with the theory. He investigated, as I said, rhodium psilocyte and cobalt psilocyte, where we don't get homochiral crystals, but the spot size is still smaller than the area of homochirality in the crystals. Okay, despite of uh, uh, the uh, bike properties and the surface state there is now a lot of discussion because cobalt psilocyte, for example, has a uh, chiral uh, charge density wave in the surface, and uh, Hassan's group continues to in, uh, continue to investigate doped single crystals of us to show here even that you get very interesting behavior in the surface state, like a Van Hofer singularity of the surface state. How the surface state then finally influence the surface properties would be an interesting is an interesting question and should be also maybe investigated in the near future okay another field which uh, i want to simply mention now at the end because we did this very nice work with philip moll whom you all know and i think this will be also again a tip of the iceberg because Philip already has many samples of us beyond this one sample. So the first sample we have investigated, or he has investigated, was the cesium vanadium antimony 5 a material where people are very much interested because we have competing charge density wave behavior here in superconductivity. And the interesting thing is, so uh, there are several transitions, and uh, uh, there was some debate whether this has a chiral charge density wave, and we have this uh, interesting uh, chiral orbital currents in the material, uh, which then breaks the symmetry so that the mirror planes, which we have at higher temperature, disappear. So it shows chirality. And Philip made out of the single crystals this very complex devices to really measure in plane of the 
uh, Kagumi lattice and could really show that he sees a magnetoelectric effect, which is a kind of transport proof, but it's not so easy to do. Therefore, if you simply take a single crystal and want to measure this uh, second order effect in the single crystal, it doesn't work because the a nonlinear effect is too small, but thanks to this very nice devices of Philip, it was possible to see. So there is some discussion, especially around this material, which inspires more and more uh, uh, measurements. Uh, but you nicely see here that you can switch the chirality in the material by switching the magnetic field relative to the current. And I think for details, I refer to this paper. Uh, which is one paper on, I'm sure there are more uh, interesting results to come for other Kagumi compounds uh, in this field. We are already working on another system and have first papers on the archive. Okay, so why do I, so I hope I gave you now already some <laughs> inspiration. Why I think it's very interesting to work on chiral, uh, topological materials and even also on materials where we can set the chirality it should be even more interesting, I would say, because this is really something very new. It started with the titanium selenide, where Nogirex group has shown uh, with uh, Chong Ma as the first author that they can set the chirality by light, chiral light. So this would be dream of a chemist who wants to make a homochiral crystal. And this is a good friend of us, Ben List, who got the Nobel Prize in 21 and already came in 2018 to us and said, look, I look for homochiral molecules. So maybe I believe that topology can help me. So we started a collaboration here. We have a, a Gu Wai Li who is doing catalysis or did catalysis. Unfortunately, he left and Ben was very busy now because of his Nobel Prize. But anyway, we still have a big dream and a big vision to look more for the interaction between chiral molecules and topological materials like bisemi metals or chiral fermions. And it could be brought even in the context of what people call this chirality induced pencil activity, where we probably in the field of topology can get also more insights. We have new first results, but we are looking forward to do more interesting experiments and also taking advantage, for example, from our chiral surface states in the chiral uh, crystals and their interaction with chiral molecules and eventually to go in direction of homochiral catalysis, hopefully soon again with, uh, in collaboration with Bendis. So this, uh, uh, with this, I come to my summary. I hope I could convince you that it's very interesting to, to see uh, the context between topology and chirality and look what else can be done there? And uh, I still think we can think about many, many more experiments, hopefully also uh, by more interesting prediction from theory uh, to, to do more investigation in direction of model systems for high energy physics and astrophysics. But it's also interesting to uh, learn more and maybe grow more uh, in antipoor uh, chiral new fermions uh, and investigate the properties here, maybe the interaction between chiral phonons, chiral, uh, chiral crystal structure, chiral surface states, etc., and how they can play together, eventually also with the impact to catalysis and enantiomorphic absorption. And I think there's even a lot to do, maybe uh, this chirality-induced pencil activity where people saw in this topological chiral crystals, even currents over micron meter homo uh, uh, spin polarized currents. So I think there's uh, really, this is a super interesting field. And as I mentioned at my beginning, we see only the tip of the iceberg and we can here reach out to chemistry, biology, high energy physics and uh, astrophysics, which I think is super exciting and interesting. And with this, I come to the end and I have to thank many people here. Yeah, sorry, I have to say here should be this shorter on the paper because this is a, 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 an old slide anyway. So, and I have to thank my whole team and all my collaborators. And I thank you for the attention. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to answer questions if they are not too difficult. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, Claudia. This was uh, this was uh, wonderful. 
to you know do a deep dive into this uh, fascinating world. So as mentioned, people are uh, very much uh, welcome to uh, write their question in the question and answers, uh, or to raise their hands so that uh, they can uh, they can ask it uh, they can ask it live. Uh, so let me actually go to the question and answer. So the basis do task, uh, and you know this uh, goes all you know to the very beginning of your talk, uh, and uh, says, is it possible to have uh, a band inversion uh, and thus topological properties uh, uh, without uh, really having a spin orbit coupling? So I think some there's one area which talks about first of all it's the direct semi metals we find in graphene. Okay, so therefore I think uh, this is more symmetry related. So the gap which you get due to the spin orbit coupling is small. Therefore, it was not a quantum spin Hall effect, but still interesting physics, you know. So still many properties are still mostly related or interesting device properties are related to the graphene. We have to say it. <laughs> anyway, the other things are the crystal topological insulators. And I agree, there are maybe some things uh, which are uh, beyond spin orbit coupling. Therefore, I think otherwise we would never reach 80%, you know, <laughs> of the materials because the heavy cont element containing materials are maybe only a, a smaller group of materials. So I think, I think topology is also beyond now spin orbit coupling. And we can also think about uh, similar band structures with band inversions or electronic structures with band inversion. I always think about in case of a chemical reaction. So then we don't have K as a, uh, as one uh, of the ordinate. Uh, so the X value, if you want, we have something like the chemical reaction path. You know, because if you have a chemical reaction, I can have also crossing point and uh, forbidden crossings. Uh, so I think there's still a lot to do in 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 many directions, and spin orbit coupling is not maybe always necessary. Thanks. So let me ask uh, uh, another question from the question and answers, uh, and that is uh, how can one uh, distinguish uh, between the bulk state? Uh, and the surface state in a Dirac semi-metal uh, with the usual experimental technique. So how do you know if you have a bulk state signature versus surface state signature? This is a very good question. And uh, the experts are at the PSI. So, <laughs> <laughs> so in photo emissions, they can easily distinguish by doing this uh, dependence of the K dispersion you know, because a surface state has a non-dispersion in uh, the direction perpendicular to the surface. So, and this is exactly what is a standard experiment if people want to say this states are surface states and the others, the bike states have, have probably a dispersion. Can be also two-dimensional material anyway, but I think uh, this is the easiest way to investigate, uh, to distinguish the surface state from the bike state. Therefore, I think in topology, the ingress of photo emission is extremely important, especially the spin polarized. Then you can get even the information what we think here, especially if you think chirality induced spin polarization would be very interesting to investigate more uh, spin dependent properties of these materials. Thanks. Um... Let me also ask a question that maybe is uh, related to the theme of Marvel in the sense that this is a field where, uh, and please correct me, but uh, somehow, you know, you show the paper by Halden, uh, you saw the paper by Kane and Meli. I mean, somehow theoretical consideration really gave uh, a lot of uh, uh, impulse. And, uh, and these days, uh, one often sees uh, uh, papers that have a combination of experimental realization and also, I would say, not so much maybe theory, although some of what you have shown was really hard uh, theory, but also computational simulations. Now, how do you operate? That is, uh, do you get inspired by some of this, uh, you know, paper that you have shown uh, with Andre and Mara and so on uh, that, uh, that, you know, sort of do high throughput screening for properties? Uh, 
or it's more that you have a hint uh, that is more a sort of experimental intuition or maybe you know symmetry consideration at least a symmetry and interesting classes where to look and then the simulation come after so it's a bit a chicken and egg question that is uh, uh, for you, what what does it come first? So it's a very interesting question. First of all, I think in most of the experiments nowadays we are driven by theory, but at the same time, the theoretician we are working close to the theoretician to keep also realistic with their prediction. As my starting point was more by intuition because uh, when Shushen Zhang came to me and uh, we or when I came to, I have to say I came to Stanford. And I recognize what is possible in Mercury Channel, right? You can do also internally semiconductors in our Häusler compound. So this was my starting point. So you have some chemical intuition eventually, uh, which drives also the theory. But I think the nice thing for theory in topology is most of the time we go with the theory. And it's true. So first, I think there's fundamental ideas, like especially with the Axial gravitational anomaly or our work on axion. This was always predicted by theory. So even fundamental theory. Then the next step is the DFT prediction of the materials. Okay. So, and I think uh, then the next step is then making the materials and seeing the properties. So, so as long as DFT works, it's a story of success, but there's still also a big part of the universe, which is not yet investigated. And this are the oxides. So I still think uh, the oxides could be our more ionic compounds where, where correlation plays a role, but this problem is not yet solved to do it in a high throughput way. I try to convince the theoretician to do simply hybrid functional and have a better description of the gaps. But anyway, so far it was not really very systematically done. But I think the, the other thing is like uh, the magnetic materials have correlation. You also place a role where people did, and I was involved in this also systematic uh, putting a U on top and doing systematic calculation. So um, anyway, still a lot to do, but I think the nice thing is for theory, uh, they really have impact here to the experiments. And later then we go back to theory and uh, discuss uh, the results. And most of the time it fits, but especially with spin momentum locking, it's still a change. So there need be more understanding and more investigation. And sometimes I think we should also publish if it doesn't fit perfectly, because more or less then the people struggle and at the end it takes a year before maybe eventually the paper get published. But these are very often the interesting cases, right? Yeah, no, no, I, I agree. There is also, you know, good theory and lousy theory and good calculation and lousy calculations. Yeah. And probably all of us have different opinions on, you know, what falls in which category. But basically, yeah. you trust enough uh, your theoretical or computational colleagues uh, to to sort of try it out. Um, let me take uh, um, a question from the question and answer panel. Says, uh, what is the most uh, straightforward uh, experimental method of determining the absolute chirality? of these materials that are often opaque. I would say this magnetoelectric effect is a nice method, but it's very difficult. And if you see how many, how less materials were investigated by magnetoelectric effect, I'm a little bit irritated, but it's not simple, you know, and therefore I think people are a little bit scared. So I would encourage more people to do nonlinear transport, but you can do it also optically. But it's also, I think, not a trivial experiment. But I would say still the smoking gun experiment for wire semi-metals is also, so this is, I learned from the, from the symposium. So we didn't convince uh, people in the other fields. It's a chiral anomaly via transport is proven as a smoking gun experiment. So I think, I like if somebody predicts now something, what you can do to maybe have some quantization. This is a nice thing of the quantized photogalvanic effect, if you can see it in the material, because the quantized value is always a smoking gun experiment. We agree here, yes. <laughs> so it's still a change. Yeah. yeah. No, thanks. Uh, thanks. And I, I think it's good we are on this uh, slide uh, because. Uh, you know, we always thought a lot about uh, uh, 
uh, say, applications of topological and quantum materials in the world of, uh, say, information and communication technology, but here you have mentioned also catalysis. Uh, but I, I think there has been, uh, you know, in this field, uh, so many scientific breakthroughs. But if you were to bet uh, on, uh, you know, the technological breakthroughs, that is, uh, where would we see, uh, you know, some uh, uh, chiral or topological materials uh, in uh, uh, technological applications? Uh, what would be your bet right now? I would say probably eventually, eventually, I think there are two fields which could be, one is the, most of the topological materials discovered at the beginning are thermoelectrics. So the question is how can we take advantage of topology to improve the thermoelectric properties? I would say this could happen fastly because I think the concept of topology, especially for transverse thermoelectrics were not considered in the past, if not investigated. And I would say catalysis are lower hanging fruits than maybe having interconnects where you really have to, uh, because the, also the application is easier, you know, you don't have to convince semiconductor industry, for example, to put a vice metal instead of copper into their devices. And I think the same is the topological quantum computer. So I think these are very high hanging fruits. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um... Thanks. Let me see if there are other uh, questions uh, from the question and answer, or is uh, if anyone dares ask a uh, live question. But if not, I have uh, a general, a final question, maybe that is uh, very dear to me, and I'm sure it's even uh, dearer to you. That is, uh, what are your thoughts? Uh, you know, on what's happening worldwide, or what's not happening uh, in terms of. Uh, material synthesis in some ways uh, you know there is all this push uh, for novel materials uh, and uh, i have the feeling but i, I i'm not an expert in the field that, that uh, uh, i mean it's being revitalized so much by all this interaction but maybe we are not building a new generation of uh, you know experimental scientists that uh, you know have really you know all the say portfolio of tool to, to you know, actually create these, these amazing materials. And, you know, who better than you to, 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 to answer this question or to, you know, say what you think is the, the status of the field actually at this stage. I agree uh, because I think we need also solid state chemistry who is simply synthesizing new materials. Yeah. Yeah. And but they they need also to interact with physicists because otherwise the materials disappear, you know, until some high throughput calculation brings them up again, you know. On the other side, I think I'm also curious about how uh, artificial intelligence can maybe at the end learn the prediction of new materials. We still need the correlation problem to be solved. <laughs> critical <I see> again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I think it's maybe so. So to maybe find I, so far, synthesis happens only by chemical intuition. Yeah, yeah. No, but I'm afraid you might be right. Actually, that is, uh, you know, for better or for worse, uh, maybe there will be actually something interesting that comes uh, from uh, you know aggregating all the scientific literature and natural language processing and uh, uh, robotic synthesis and. Uh, and somehow, you know, sort of being very insistent with robots of doing some of the, you know, most boring actually tasks that sometimes are needed. Exactly, because so far there are only a few chemists in the world and everybody has a certain niche where they are interested in, but we might miss some interesting areas of, uh, uh, of uh, where, where there's a rich possibility which maybe is not in the interest of the chemists because they are interested in very, very yeah. strange, very, very complex structures by properties very often appear even in not so complex system for the moment, at least now. Great, I think on this note, uh, we can only thank you for, uh, for this very enjoyable and insightful lecture. It's recorded for posterity. So it's all on our Materials Cloud website. And uh, thanks again, and we'll be waiting for you in person here at EPFN and at PSI. Thank you yeah. again.
Thank you very much. Bye. It was my pleasure. Thank you. And bye to everyone. Bye.